ಸ್ತ್ಯಕ್ತ್ವಾಪಮ್ಯಂ ಪ್ರಭವತಿ ಜಗತ ಅನೇಕಧಾನುಗ್ರಹಾಯ ಪ್ರಕ್ಷೀಣ ಕ್ಲೇಶರಾಶಿ ವಿಷಮ ವಿಷಧರ ಅನೇಕ ವಕ್ರ ಸುಭೋಗಿ ಸರ್ವಜ್ಞಾನ ಪ್ರಸೂತಿ ಭೋಜಗರಿಕರ ಪ್ರೀತೀಷ ಸೋವ್ಯಾತ್ ಸಿತಮಲತನು ಯೋಗದೋ ಯೋಗಯುಕ್ತ ಯೋಗೀನ ಚಿತ್ತದೇನ ಮಲ ಶರೀರ ವೈದ್ಯಕೇನ ಯೋಪಾಕರ ಮುನೀನ ಪತಂಜಲಿ ಪ್ರಾಣ್ಯಲಿರಾನತೋಸ್ಮಿ ಆಷಾಕಾರ ಶಂಖಚಕ್ರಾಸಿ ಧಾರಿಣ ಸಹಸ್ರಶಿರಸ ಶ್ವೇತ ಪ್ರಣಮಿ ಪತಂಜಲಿ ಶ್ರೀಮತೆ ಅನಂತ ನಾಗರಾಜ ನಮೋ ನಮ ಪಾತಂಜಲ ಮಹಾಭಾಷ್ಯ ಚರಕ ಪ್ರತಿ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತ ಮನೋವಾಕಾಯ ದೋಷಾಂ ಹತ್ರೇ ಅಹಿ ಪತೇ ನಮಃ So, friends, we are in the Sutra, Vishaya Vativa Pravritti Rutpanna Manasaha Sthiti Nibandhini. Last week we saw the Sutra 134, Prachardana Vidharana Abhyam Va Pranasya, where Patanjali is talking about the concept of Pranayama, how Pranayama is useful in calming the mind into a quieter state, into a more focused state, etc. As a natural extension of this, Patanjali is going to continue to talk about another very important sutra, Vishayavativa Pravritti Rutpanna Manasaha Sthiti Nibandini. This sutra is concerning the senses and prana, pranayama and senses are very closely related. If you look at the second chapter also, Patanjali talks about pranayama, then pratyahara. If you look at this first chapter now, Patanjali is doing the same thing, he is presenting pranayama and immediately after it is a sutra that is related with something to do with the senses. <coughs> he presents it in a very interesting way. Vishayavati va pravritti hi utpanna manasa asthiti nipandini. The word Vishayavati means concerning Vishayas, concerning objects. Vishaya means an object. Now, <coughs> as people one of the things that we have is a relationship with objects we have always a relationship with an object and this we cannot remove from we cannot remove separate ourselves from the relationship with objects when we say object in this context the word object vishaya means that which can be grasped by the senses that's why the word vishaya has been used because vishaya means that which can be grasped by the senses. Now what is that which can be grasped by the senses? These are objects. Objects includes not only objects like things like a car or a, a telephone or a computer etc. 
It also includes all the objects in the world that we can see through the senses, which include people, which includes animals, which includes plants, which includes all of these things that we are in relationship with through the senses, through the medium of the senses. That is why it is called a Vishaya. So, <clears throat> Vishayavadiva Pravrittihi Utpanna Manasaha Stiti Nibandini What Patanjali says is one reason why we are having a disturbance of mind is because the relationship we share with these sensory objects. Now, <clears throat> when you look at our life, we are all having different relationships with different objects. Say for example, people. We don't have a relationship with only one kind of person. We have a relationship with many kinds of people. We have family members, we have friends, we have employees in the office, we have colleagues in our workplace, those who are working below us, those who are working above us. We have neighbors, we have people who live in our neighborhood who are not our neighbors. We have common people who are coming to your restaurant in the morning to have breakfast with you every day. There are people like this who are sharing a relationship with all kinds of people. Let's just take the example of people. All the people do not disturb you. All the people do not make you happy. There are not all the people are not making you happy. There are not all the people which are making you unhappy. You cannot say, oh, I am very happy with my family. Even in the family you may have some relationship that is very touchy and sensitive with some members of the family <clears throat> and some others who are very comfortable where you feel very free and open, etc. The same with animals. Some animals you are drawn to, some animals you are not drawn to. Even in the same class of animals, let's say you take dogs, let's say you take cats. It's not that all dogs you are attracted to, all dogs you are repulsed, repulsed to, etc. <clears throat> There's always different relationships we are sharing. So, and therefore what Patanjali is saying is one of the reasons why the mind is disturbed is because sometimes the relationship with objects creates disturbances in the relationship. Patanjali is saying, inquiring, inquiring into <clears throat> the origins of such relationship. Why is it that we are drawn to somebody? Why is it that we are again drawn away from somebody? What Patanjali calls is pravritti. Pravritti is like a movement, a very subtle movement. Sometimes we can say an unconscious movement, sometimes we can say conscious movement, etc. <clears throat> but there is some movement, a momentum. There is a momentum towards somebody, there is a momentum away from somebody. Now when you look at certain people, you, when you are meeting them for the first time and you start talking to them, either you run away from them or you are moving towards them. What Patanjali says is, this is not because there is something in them that is disturbing you. <clears throat> this is because there is something in you that is being disturbed through this relationship you have with them. We all carry what is called vasanas. We all carry what is called samskaras. We all carry different things. So, there is a tendency for the vasanas and samskaras to interfere in the relationship that we are <coughs> sharing with people which can come from our past. For example, <coughs> let us say you, you there is a family situation where one child is an only child and it receives a lot of attention from mother and father which it loves very much. Now, that momentum is built, that vasana is built into the child and as the child is growing, this becomes stronger and stronger. It will probably expect such a relationship from other people it is meeting, especially for example from people who are in position of an authority or something because mother and father are in some way our first unconscious authorities. 
So, <clears throat> the child may, not always, may exhibit this capacity for this because that is what is in its in its momentum. That's why it's used to. So, obviously, if the person, let's say a school teacher or a principal or a college teacher, etc., who is also in a similar authority, is not giving the same kind of attention, <clears throat> this disturbs the child or this disturbs that person because what it is seeking unconsciously, please remember this may not be, even be in a conscious level, this may be in an unconscious level, what it is seeking is not happening. Therefore, there is agitation. So, the Utpanna, where something is arising, the origins of our problems, is not always on the object, it is what is inside us. That's why Patanjali says in the later chapter, Vastu Samye Chitta Bhedate Tayoho Vibhakta Pantaha. In the presence of an object, because there are differences in the mind that is observing that object, different paths are established. For one person who may want no attention from the principal or the teacher, Getting no attention may actually be very comfortable. For one person who wants a lot of attention, the same principal or teacher who is not giving that attention may be disturbing. The problem is not with the teacher. The problem is with the person's vasanas, the person's deep origins of this. So this is very important for us to understand because the relationship we share with all kinds of things, all kinds of objects has an origin within us. It's not dependent on the object. It's not dependent on the object. Simple example, <clears throat> let's say, <laughs> um, so this happened long time ago. Uh, my father gave me one very nice <coughs> photograph of the Bhagavad Gita teaching where Krishna is teaching Arjuna. And so I, I frame it nicely in a little glass and the person who, who was coming from the frame shop brought it and he leave it in the house, in the entrance of the house. At, a, at the entrance of my room actually because he didn't want to come inside so he left it outside and went. In those days we had a dog called Tulsi, very ex exciting Labrador. Now for that Labrador, the dog that is not the Bhagavad Gita instruction of Lord Krishna, it is just a plaything. So it goes and smells. And in this experiment the glass frame just broke, smashed. You know, and Tulsi was so curious, she kind of grabbed that painting, a picture also, because it was, I think it was done with a little special paint. And of course, the paint always has smell. So it was attracted, it wanted to see what was, so it's so smart, she drew that painting out of, and then she started it kind of consuming it. <laughs> so, you see, the same object, it's a source of reverence for somebody. It's a source of plaything for somebody else. The object is not to blame. The different minds are having different relationship with the object. The same object has different relationship. The pravritti for the dog <coughs> is different for the pravritti for me or my father. And therefore the relationship that we share with it is different for us. It's so sacred. For the dog, it's different, it's a plaything. So, origin of suffering is not in the object. We are so easily blaming objects for our suffering. When I say object, it includes people. When something is disturbing in somebody, we say, oh, this person is hurting me, this person is agitating me. He triggers all my problems. Yes, that's the correct word. He triggers all my problems. The problems are ours. The other person is not the problem. Nobody can blame objects. That is what is the message of Patanjali is trying to say in this sutra. <clears throat> that the, the origins of this is very important. That's why he is saying, go into the origins of the problem. Why is it disturbing you? 
What is it that is creating this problem? Start reflecting on this. And when I say reflecting, I don't mean analysis because sometimes we can get trapped with mental analysis. It is more like going towards the feelings. And he says the more and more you go deeper, that's why the word is Utpanna. Where is it springing from? Where is it sprouting from? The word Utpanna. Where is it sprouting from? You will see that it can go very deep into our structure. Sometimes it need not come from us. It can come from those behind us. Because we are not only carrying impressions that is coming from our life. <clears throat> we are also carrying impressions that are coming from our ancestors. My father and mother had experiences that they pass on to me through their through the blood. Their father and mother had experiences that were passed on to mother and father who passed on to us. So, it's very possible that some of these discomfort or comfort is coming not just from us but from somebody behind us. That is why the tricky part is there. You cannot analyze it because in the modern era, especially in psychoanalysis, psychotherapy, modern medicine and modern era, science, we always want to give a structure to it, a box. This is what it is. We want to get into the source that is, okay, I was abused, therefore I have this problem. Oh, I, have, I was beaten, I was bullied, therefore I have this problem. We want to give a structure to it. But it need not even be that structure because sometimes the experience of the vasana can be subconscious and not at all having a cognitive structure. Some of the experiences that even we have had can come from the time where the brain was not even cognitive. We could have still been in our mother's womb and we don't, the brain is not fully developed but the vasana is there. Our body feels the vasana. Some of the vasanas that we are carrying could come from mother and father subconscious vasanas which we don't know in a form we don't know but in function we can feel in a function we can feel so what Patanjali is trying to say is try to go to the origin and make peace with that recognize that there is something in you that is disturbing already calms your mind you may not necessarily know the source of what exactly is the problem. You may not exactly know the source of what exactly is the problem. You can, <clears throat> like a lot of uh, people say, oh, I saw the murder of, or death of my father or mother when I was young. But not everybody whose father or mother died when they were young is reacting the same way. Not everybody who has seen murder is reacting the same way. Not everybody who has been abused or bullied in school is reacting the same way. All the experiences will only contribute to this what the seed already holds. Simple metaphor. There is rain. There is sunshine. And in a land, for example, my mother has a wonderful garden. There is lots of different flowers, lots of different seeds, lots of different plants. The sun is shining the same way in all the plants. The water with the rain is coming, when the rains are coming, the water is always the same for all the plants. But not every plant is becoming the same plant. A brinjal remains a brinjal, a tomato remains a tomato, a potato remains a potato. Why? Because the seed is what is happening. The brinjal or the tomato or the potato does not blend the sun or the rain for causing problems for it to behave differently. It, still, it takes that experience and only consistent with what it holds is it evolving into. So it's not saying, oh rain you are too much. It's not good. It cannot. It just accepts that and moves on. The same we have to do. We cannot the same experience cannot manifest the same way in all of us. We may be a family of four or five children in my, for example, in my household. We were three of us, brother, sister, myself. We had challenging times in our childhood. We had happy times in the childhood. 
all the people do not have the same memory of the incident because everybody experiences the same experience differently. And that is what Patanjali is saying here. Do not blame outside factors. Look at what is inside. Later he will explain. The triggers are always inside us. Etu phala ashraya alambanaihi sangrihi dhukva desha madhavi kadabhava. This is one part of the discussion of the sutra where it says, as far as sensory relationships are concerned, going into the origins of such relationships is very important. Why somebody is attracted to photography? Why somebody is attracted to music? Why somebody is attracted to painting? Why somebody is attracted to dance? Is because there is an origin inside them. There is a seed inside them. It's not because the photographer outside is a great photographer. They may be a great photographer, but not everybody appreciates that photography. They may be a great dancer, but nobody, <clears throat> not everybody attracts, is attracted to the dancer or the dancing. Because the seed is different. And therefore the relationship is different. This is very, very important. There's another important thing that Patanjali is talking about this and Acharya Krishnamacharya also explores this in great detail. Our senses are not based on <clears throat> pure perception. Senses are based on the perception that is behind it, what is called mind, structure which has memories. When you look at somebody, you don't look at them in a pure form. You look at them with memories. You look at them with imagination. <clears throat> look at them with a combination of imagination, memory, which is cognitive, uh, which is cognitive, non-cognitive, conscious, subconscious. It's a combination of all this. Patanjali calls this kalpita vritti, a created perception. The moment you see somebody, you already look at them as a woman. Don't look at that person as a neutral person. You already look at them as a woman. Then you see, oh, this person looks like somebody I know. So the imagination takes over. This person reminds me of, oh, her nose is crooked like the nose of my school teacher who was nasty to me. So immediately we make this monstrous association to that person. She must be the same. We are not the same, but memory and imagination takes us because the senses are also governed by this pattern. So, the glasses does not see, the glasses meaning not the physical glasses, but our eyes, our senses, does not see the persons we are relating with in a pure way. It already sees it in a biased way. It already sees this in a biased way. And therefore, we get disturbed or calm. My father always used to say this fantastic story where many, many years ago, I think this was in the 90s, one, one student of my father came from Europe to meet him. And this man wanted to, uh, somehow he wanted to visit an Indian temple and he wanted very seriously to visit an Indian temple. So my father said, okay, let us go to a Ganesha temple which is not so far, it is just here a few minutes from our house. So my father <coughs> takes him to the Ganesha temple and this man, European man, gets so agitated, so disturbed. He says to my father, are you trying to agitate me? Why are you doing this? Blah, blah. And he starts his projection. And my father said, why are you reacting like that? He says, look where you have brought me. Look where you have brought me. I wanted to go to an Indian temple. My father said, this is an Indian temple. This is a Ganesha temple. And that man said, look where you have brought me. And then my father kept looking and said, we are in this. And my father at one moment thought, perhaps this man was a bit hallucinating or something like that. Then only understood what was happening. He understood because in most of our Ganesha temples we have a very special symbol. And this symbol is very close to the symbol that the German uh, Nazi uh, symbol of the swastika was. It was a little twisted. 
So this man got so agitated because this poor man also came from Germany and uh, he, uh, in the generation where he came from there were still strong memories of this. So his eyes could only see this through that perception and that <coughs> But if this man had not had this bias, he would not have seen that way. That is what most Indian people do not have because for us in India, this kind of symbol has been in Indian temple for thousands of years and that is a different pravritti. It's a different momentum. Whereas for somebody else, it is a different momentum. So senses, even what we see, we don't see things the same way. Forget about other things like feelings. Even what we see, we do not see the same way. We do not see it the same way. You know, there is a great story <clears throat> in the Ramayana, there is a great story. Hanuman is going to Lanka to search for Sita in the uh, Ravana's palaces. And Hanuman sees so many beautiful women there. So many beautiful women. In India, in the tradition, there is a rule. There is a very important Shastric rule. But a man must never see a woman sleeping. Except his own wife. That is a rule. Now nobody follows it. <laughs> because now we are going trying, we are seeing the person sleeping here, sleeping there. Because in, in, the, in the old days, there is a rule. <clears throat> when Hanuman sees all these beautiful women seen, he reminds himself of the rule and says, Oh my God, I have made a mistake. I have seen women sleeping. That is a mistake. He reminds himself of that. Now we come to the main story in a moment. But he also reminds himself. Immediately, he reminds himself. I have not seen them as a woman whom I desire. I see them all as mothers. And therefore, I have not made a mistake. And therefore, he says, I am not uh, charged with this guilt of seeing a woman who is sleeping. Now, <clears throat> for all these women were Ravana's, uh, how do you say, wives or uh, mistresses or however you want to call it. For Ravana, the way he was seeing this woman is very different from how Hanuman was seeing this woman. So, the same Vishaya. The same person even visually appear differently for these different people. That is what is the programming of the senses, the pravritti. Pravritti means movement, momentum. One person who is used to a certain thing, a certain way, looks at some things in a certain way based on the programming. For example, somebody who is a food addict. They will look at food a certain way, whereas somebody else who is not a food addict will look at food a different way because the senses do not have the same momentum. So that's why what Patanjali says is go back and see the origin of that. Uppanna, where is this pravritti originating from? Go, start looking at it and you will always find that where it is looking at it, where these objects are coming from is not coming from the object, it is coming from what is within you. It is coming from what is within you. It is never the object. Very easy for us to blame objects. Very easy for us to blame objects. I mean, <clears throat> we read in the newspaper sometimes that uh, <clears throat> some people in America are suing tobacco companies because they say, well, you make cigarette, therefore you are seducing me to smoke and therefore you are guilty, not me who is the smoker. This is not fair. The object is not to be blamed or the maker of the object is not to be blamed. The person deep inside is to be blamed. And that is where comes the next point when I use the word the maker of the object. In the Shastras, in the Vedic tradition, we have what is called Two kinds of perception. What is called Aindriya Pramana and the other one is called Shastriya Pramana. 
Aindriya Pramana is almost like Pratyaksha, it is sensory perception. Now, when I look at a sensory perception, we are all looking at objects and the relationship we are establishing with the object is based on the sensory relationship. You have, you have some food, that food is gratifying for the senses, we like that food. That food is not gratifying for the senses, we don't like that food. The same way a person, if they are gratifying in some ways, when we are happy with them, we want to have a relationship with them. When we are unhappy with them, we don't want to have a relationship with them. The same with an object or a car or a product, the car makes you happy, you want relationship, nourish that relationship, it doesn't make you happy, you dispose it. This is what is called Aindriya Pramana, Pramana that comes from Indriyas, senses. And we are almost all of us, we are relating with objects based on the Indriyas. This is the classic era. That's why even in the marketing they say, the best way to sell products to people is through sensory gratification. Make somebody sensory happy, then they will buy that product. You see, everybody is telling you how to buy. If you buy the iPhone, how exciting it is for your senses. You eat this food, how exciting it is. It's always about sensory gratification. Acharya, Krishna Acharya says there is some other pramana, what is called Shastriya pramana. Shastriya pramana is a pramana based on the Shastras. What is the Shastra saying? The Shastras are saying that all the objects that we are seeing in this world are all created by the same creator. It's all the same creator. And not only did the creator create all these things, the creator also is present in all of these things. The creator is also present in all of these things. Therefore, when you look at all the objects as a manifestation of the creator, as a container for the creator, your relationship changes with the object. That's what Bhagavad Gita says also when Krishna is teaching the Arjuna the concept of Samadarshita. He says, Look at all the objects, all the people, as if I am in all of them. So, I, you will look at everything the same. See me in everything, see everything in me. This is what is called Samadarshita. So, the moment you start looking at all the objects as a manifestation of the Divine, your relationship changes no more. The teacher is a teacher. The teacher is a manifestation of the divine. No more. An apple is an apple. An apple is a manifestation of the divine. The person you don't like, your neighbor, who is disturbing you, who is triggering your vasana or your thing, he is no more your, your uh, terrible neighbor. He is also a manifestation of the divine. So, the moment you start doing that, you are not going to be agitated. Because the source through which you are having a relationship with is changing from sensory to something deeper that is in a spiritual domain. That's what Hanuman was doing. He was not looking at these women as a sensory object that he can enjoy. He looked at them from a different perspective saying, Oh, they are divine mothers. So, I will not have any kind of, I have not made any mistake. Because he never had that feeling. He even describes it beautifully in a verse. No, he says, I never had any desire, nor does my body reveal that I have any feelings. And my conscience and my heart is so pure when I look at them, so I have not made a mistake of looking at them when they are sleeping. He reminds himself of that. Because generally speaking, if you look at the reason why the Shastra is also saying that we should not look at women when they are sleeping is also because when the clothing is moving, the sleep, certain things can be revealed and certain things and this can create desire in some people. So that's why they say you must not look at, men should not look at women when they are sleeping. Women should not look at men when they are sleeping. 
this is the shastra except if they are a husband or a wife or if they are brother or sister when they are young or a parent it's very in a very small there are things like this this is not how we live now it's very different nowadays so the idea here is we are changing the origin of the relationship when you are relating with an object if your origin of the pravritti is sensory then there is possibility for disturbance in the mind because even something goes up even if it's a good happy relationship happy situation with that object please remember the moment something goes up it has to come down what can make you happy at one moment can make you unhappy at another moment whereas the moment we are seeing all the objects or all the vishayas in this world as a manifestation of the divine samadarshita brings samatva brings an equanimity in the relationship because we are relating with everything from a very pure place not from an impure place so that everything in this world is sacred when we start looking at that sacred that's in everything then we become very very quiet and calm and in the vedic shastra they say that is why in this shastriya pramana they are saying if you cannot see the divine in everything you cannot see the divine it's not that the divine only is choosing to appear in one particular form in one particular religion in one particular country in one particular temple this is not how divine is manifesting if you really understand the shastra the divine manifests in everything and therefore every object or everything you are relating with relate it as if it is a precious so in the traditional time for example even a farmer when he would get his tools or <clears throat> a person who is making pots a person who is making uh, knives a person who is making everything everything even the tools when he is using he will always do a puja in the morning first for that before he actually does it we have this today few even in some places i go to my wonderful uh, barber who is very simple barber not fancy salon like uh, tony and guy and all these rich places i go to a street side barber who is using still a blade i think which his grand great great grandfather used and uh, his way of uh, making it sterilized is taking a old newspaper and rubbing it it's very simple and dipping it in some antiseptic lotion and then he will rub it very nicely with an old newspaper when you go to him it is the old school and of course he changes the blade because this blade has a fixed part and a disposable part so he will use a new blade don't worry but when you go to him you will see that every day when he go when he starts open the shop he will not see me immediately to start shaving or cutting he will always do a little puja where he is worshiping the tools which is using before he is using and this we have this system in all traditional things they were doing this and even in a year for example once a year they are not supposed to work they are supposed to keep all the tools clean it and keep it in front of the gods for one day and do what is called ayudha puja ayudha means a tool ayudha is a tool they do ayudha puja then only they start work using it for another year and every day they are worshiping so they are seeing the divine in their tool as well because that tool is what is feeding them nourishing them the job is what is nourishing them feeding them so they treat their job the tools they are using in the job the people who are coming in the job as if they are divine manifest this is how the teaching was integrated into our social life It was not something that you had to go to a school to learn. This is how social life was constructed. All this we have somehow lost nowadays, which is why Patanjali is asking us to relook. Where are you going to have a relationship with the object? That is why Acharya Krishna Acharya says in this sutra we have to understand it from the point of view that there are two kinds of pramana. One is Indriya pramana, that is comprehension through the senses, which is always going to be biased. the senses like something senses don't like something very often we choose what the senses like but not what is actually good my ayurvedic doctor always used to say what tastes very nice in the tongue is not so good for the body 
what tastes very bad in the tongue is usually very good for the body. An example is when you take uh, sugar, so nice and tasty, but it's very bad for the body. Whereas when you take something like a neem leaf, so bitter, you put in the mouth, your face already goes like that. But in the body, it's very good. So sometimes the senses cheat us. Because senses want relationship with things that it is very comfortable, it is very happy. Short term, he has to come. And that is why we have problems. But as the Shastras are saying, look at everything as a divine manifestation. So you'll have a neutral relationship there, then there is no more sweet or bitter. It's all divine, it's all sacred. And that is why this Sutra is very significant because it is asking us to go back to reflect on the origin of what, where, from where are we relating with that object. Because please remember, even when you are relating with an object and if you have to see the divine in that object, you also have to see the divine in yourself. So, from where are you relating? From the divine in you to the divine in the other. That's why in our Shastras or in our tradition, we don't tell people, Hello, how are you? What's up? We say Namaste, which means I am honoring that Ishwara inside you. From that Ishwara inside me, you say Namaste to them, they will say Namaste back to us. Because they are, we are honoring each other's divine that is in our heart. So the relationship is different there. Whereas if you are saying, oh, hi, how are you? You look so wonderful today. That means your senses are speaking. Because tomorrow you may not look uh, wonderful because tomorrow you can say, oh, you have a very bad hair day. Your hair is not nice, what happened? Oh, your eyes are so dark. You can say all these things, but when you are saying namaste, you are forgetting about all this. The relationship you are doing is from a deeper place. And that's where we have to understand this sutra saying, that we have to establish where we are relating with objects from. And with those words, we have to conclude today's lecture with Namaste.